Hey everyone, welcome to my next video. Today we're going to be covering the Euler product formula. This is a formula named for the 18th century Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler, who was probably the most prolific mathematician of all time, writing more, more papers than any other mathematician, and in fact doing the majority of his work after he had gone completely blind, which is pretty impressive, I must say. And so today we're going to talk about this formula, which is a relationship between sums of natural numbers and products of prime numbers. So here we go. Okay, first, what are natural numbers? Well, you might better know them as what you were told they were called in elementary school, which is counting numbers. It's the way we count, one, two, three, and so on. I like to think of natural numbers the way a toddler first learns to count. And so think about the way you would ask a toddler, how old are you? And what is the generic response you get? Something along the lines of, I'm this many, or however many they actually are. Now this toddler does not know the concept of a year, does not know the concept really of a number, but they can visualize this. I have had a birthday celebration, I've had another birthday celebration, and I've had another birthday celebration. So I've had this many birthday celebrations, so this is how many I am. They're seeing a one-to-one -one relationship between the birthday celebrations and their fingers, or some other solid object. And so to them, this is how we count, and that is how we count. That is the natural way to count. And so these are natural numbers. Now, before you get all adult thinking on me and say, well, what about the number zero? Well, we can't represent the number zero with a number of fingers, can we? Now, you might try to be tricky and say, well, just take all your fingers away. Well, then what we have here is actually one fist, which I will use to punch you in the teeth if you try to tell me zero is a natural number again. Okay, so really, we think about these numbers as being in a set. And in math, we denote a set with braces. And we say that the natural numbers start with the number 1, and then we go to the number 2, and then we go to the number 3, and so on, dot, dot, dot. We put an ellipsis, and we close the braces. So why do we have the ellipsis there? Well, it's to say that the natural numbers go on forever. There is no end to the natural numbers. To see this, picture the largest natural number you can. Now add 1 to it. You get a bigger number. Now do it again. You get a bigger number. You can do that ad infinitum, into infinity, or ad nauseum, until you want to puke. And there is no largest number you will ever get. Therefore, the natural numbers go into infinity. Now, when we print the set of natural numbers, we use like a bold capital N. But when I'm writing the set of natural numbers to symbolize them, it's not easy to do a bold. And so we have another method of doing that. And so we start with this idea of the capital N, and then we kind of double the middle there. And we say that that represents the set of natural numbers. And so we say we define the set of natural numbers to be equal to the set like this. Now, as mathematics matured, we learned faster ways of counting things quicker. For example, addition. Now, when I change the number of things I have, rather than having to recount each time, I can use addition and the simple facts of addition to quickly add them up. Then we also noticed that if I could break this addition up into adding the same thing over and over again, that I can do it even faster, which we now call multiplication. I'm adding the same thing multiple times. And with multiplication comes a lot of nice patterns and very easy to memorize facts. And I'm sure you remember learning your multiplication tables back in elementary school. Well, what became obvious to those who studied it was that some numbers showed up in more than one way and some didn't. And so it became kind of a, a, a topic of interest. What numbers show up in what ways? And so I'm going to kind of demonstrate that here by way of a couple of examples. Let's start with the number 24. I'm going to ask myself, how do I multiply to get to 24? Well, I could do 1 times 24. I could do 2 times 12. I could do 3 times 8. I could do 4 times 6. And if I tried to find any other ways, I would find I couldn't. And so I see I've got four ways I can multiply, four unique ways to get to 24. Now, how about the number 21? Well, again, I could do 1 times 21. I could also do 3 times 7. And I can't.
can't find any other ways. It's just those two ways. Okay, fair enough. Now let's take a look at another number. 23. How can I multiply to get to 23? Well, I could do 1 times 23. And that's it. That is the only way I can multiply to get to 23. Huh. Interesting. So if I take any number smaller than 23 and try to multiply it with any other number, I will never get to 23. And what early mathematicians recognized was there was lots of numbers like this. And these numbers they recognized had some amount of importance because we can't construct those numbers. They start as they are. There's no way to build up to those numbers. And so those became known as prime numbers. So how do we better identify prime numbers? Well, we say they're numbers you can get by multiplying one times itself. And that's it. Now, because every number can be done, can do that. In fact, we, we saw that for 24 and 21 as well. So really, a better way to think about it is to say, okay, ignore that. Whenever I multiply one times anything, it stays the same. That's trivial. So that's always going to be there. So we don't care about that. Look for any other way to multiply to build to that number. Well, with 24, I still have three other ways. With 21, I've got one other way, but with 23, I have none. So 23, I say there's no way to construct this number because I don't care about one times itself. And so therefore, it's what we call a prime number. Now, the next thing we want to know is how can I better identify prime numbers? I'd really like to know if I can identify all of them or if I can find a pattern to them. And that's what we're going to explore next. Okay. The method we're going to use to find prime numbers is called the sieve of Aristoteles. It's named after the Greek man who uh, discovered it, and it's pretty straightforward. What I've got here is a grid of the numbers 1 through 100, and what I want you to visualize though is that this doesn't have to be limited to 100. In fact, ideally this will go on forever. So an incredibly large collection of natural numbers. And it starts like this. First, we see the number 1, and we cross it off. Why do we cross it off? Well, we kind of talked about that when we said one times anything is itself, and that can happen for any number. That's really a trivial example. Although it's important fundamentally in mathematics, we don't want to consider one a prime number. The biggest reason why is because almost every fundamental theorem we have for prime numbers, we'd have to start it off with, with the exception of one, here it is for the prime numbers. That's just silly. We don't want to take the time to do that. So we just say it's not a prime number which actually makes sense. All right, so the next number in the list is two, and we circle that, and we say two is the first prime number. And we can check that it's prime, because we say, how do I multiply to get to two? Well, there's only one way, it's one times two. Now, if I think of two as a building block, I think of what are all the numbers I can construct with two? Well, I could do two times two, and that's four. So four is not prime. I could do two times three, that's six. So six is not prime. I could do 2 times 4, that's 8, so 8 is not prime. And likewise, 2 times 5 is 10, so 10 is not prime. And then look at the pattern here. I'm crossing off all of the multiples of 2 after 2 itself, because these numbers can be composed of 2 as a prime number. And so we call these numbers composite numbers. And so I'm going to finish out this chart by crossing off all of the even numbers. And there, we have successfully crossed off half the numbers on this chart, all of which have been even, with the exception, of course, of one, and we didn't cross off two. And we say that all that I've crossed off are not prime numbers, or more accurately, they're composite numbers. Now, it turns out the next number in the chart has to be prime. Because prior to that, the only prime number I had did not cross it off. That means I can't construct three with the prime number two. But we can also verify by recognizing that the only way to multiply to get to 3 is 1 times 3. So 3 is a prime number. And now I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to think of all the numbers I can compose or construct with the number 3, and those have to be crossed off as well because they must be composite numbers. That is, I'm just crossing off the multiples of 3. Well, 3 times 2 is 6. Oh, but 6 is already crossed off. Well, that means 6 is composed of both 2 and 3. But either way, it's still a composite number. So I, I'm going to be having less work to do now. I'm only crossing off the odd multiples of 3. So we've got 3 times 3 is 9. 3 times 5 is 15. 
3 times 7 is 21, 3 times 9 is 27, and so on. There, now we've successfully crossed off all the multiples of the only primes we've found so far, 2 and 3. And again, the next number must be a prime number. Well, 4 is not available, because I've already crossed it off. So the next one available is 5. And again, I can verify 5 is prime in two ways. Prior to 5, the only, all the prime numbers I found are 2 and 3, and neither one of those can be used to make a 5. And the only way I can multiply to 5 is 1 times 5. So again, it is definitely prime. And then I do the same thing. I'm going to go through and mark off all of the multiples of 5 after 5 itself, because those can't be prime numbers. And again, we're going to find there are many that are already marked off. And counting by 5s is easy. I got 5, 10, 15, 20, 20. Ooh, there we go. Here I got my first one. 25, then 30. Ooh, and then 35, 40, 45, 50. Ooh, then 55, 60. Ooh, 65, 70, 75, 80. Ooh, 85, 90. Ooh, 95, and 100. All right. So we can see we're really narrowing down our list here. And again, the next one, 7. 7 must be prime. And again, prior to 7, I have found all the primes, and none of those can be used to construct a 7. And the only way to multiply to 7 is 1 times 7. And so now I go through my chart, and I find whatever multiples of 7 have not already been crossed off. Now here's what's really kind of interesting. At this point, there's only three numbers. Um, if you go through the multiples of 7, the first one that hasn't been crossed off yet is 49. The second one that hasn't been crossed off yet is 77. And the third one that hasn't been crossed off yet is 91. Verify for yourself, if you don't believe me, that all the other multiples of 7 have already been crossed off this list. All right. Then we continue to go forward on our list and find the next prime. But before we do that, I can actually stop and say at this point that I've already crossed off all the composite numbers on my chart. All of the remaining numbers are prime. And I can say that with certainty, even if I hadn't already done this before and known that. And there's a really cool trick that allows me to know that for sure. And I'm going to leave it to you to see if you can figure it out. I'm going to post a secondary video after this with the answer to that. Before you watch that one, see if you can figure it out on your, out on your own, how you can know, given a chart of any size, so not just 100, but any size, how can you know when you're done, when you're using the seed of Eratosthenes, that all the remaining numbers are prime? So for now, take my word for it, and I'm just going to go ahead and circle them. We've got 11, 13, 17, 19. And there we have it. All of the prime numbers between 1 and 100 are what we have circled up here on this chart. Now, a couple of things stand out to me. The first one is there's a lot more red than blue. I've crossed out more numbers than I've circled. But there are a lot more circled than I may have thought in the first place. I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking, OK, as I get larger, it should be harder and harder for me to find a number that I cannot construct from a smaller number. It would seem intuitive to me that as I get larger, I'm more likely to be composite. The prime numbers should become more and more sparse. And in fact, that's actually the case. If we were to do this out into the millions or even larger, we find that we go longer and longer distances between prime numbers on average. It is true there can still be consecutive odd prime numbers, but then there may be hundreds of numbers before there's another prime number. And so the next question we might ask ourselves is, is there a largest prime number? We know there's not a largest natural number, but can I get to a point where I'm so big that no matter what, I can always find a way to construct this number out of previously found primes? And that's what we're going to look for next. Now, it turns out the answer to this question, how many primes are there, is actually a very easy one. And um, it was actually first known to Euclid. Uh, the, we talked about him last time, the mathematician from the ancient Greeks who actually developed all of geometry that you study in high school. And he started by saying this, consider a finite collection of primes. So remember how we write sets. We use braces. And I'm going to call my primes p. So let's say I've got some p sub 1. I've got some p sub 2. I've got some p sub 3. And I go all the way up to some p sub r for any natural number r. 
This is just my collection of prime numbers. And he said this set can be of any size. It can be of size one. You can put just one prime number in here. Make it the smallest one if you want, just the number two. But it doesn't matter. You have a finite collection of primes. He says now we're going to define this number a. And we're going to say a is equal to the product of all of these primes in this set. So a equals p sub 1 times p sub 2 times p sub 3 times da da dot p sub r. Okay? So we're just going to multiply all those primes together. He then said, all right, now we're going to take a and we're going to add 1 to it. And we're going to say that equals some other number. Let's call it m. All right? And we're going to focus on this number m here. And when we can tell one thing about m right away, it's a natural number. It has to be, because it's constructed from a and 1. And a is a multiple of primes, and primes are all natural numbers. So I just take a bunch of natural numbers and multiply them together, and I get a natural number, which is what a is. And then I add 1 to it, and I get another natural number. In this case, we're calling it m. Now, we, that means we know m has to be in one of two categories. Either it's prime or it's composite. So let's consider each case. If m is prime, it cannot be in my original list. Well, why is that? Well, think about it. Let's go back to the simplest list. Let's make it just the number 2. So the only prime I have in my list is 2. And to construct m, I have to add 1. I'm getting bigger than the only number I have in that list. Now, let's say it's not 1. I have a bunch of primes in there. Well, as a is a product of all of those primes, Heck, let's say I made them in order. So this is the smallest prime in my list all the way up to the largest prime in my list. It means I have my largest prime, p sub r, is being multiplied by at least one other prime number, which we know the smallest prime number is 2. So at the very least, I'm doubling my largest prime when I'm creating a. Therefore, a itself is already bigger than the largest number in my set. And then I'm adding 1 to it, making it even bigger. So m is too big. It's too big to have been in this set originally. Therefore, if it's a prime number, it's a new prime number, one that was never in this set to begin with. All right, well, what if it's a composite number? Well, as we know, composite numbers are composed of fundamental prime numbers that, that build up to it, that construct up to it. Then I can say, OK, what if then this has to be divisible by some prime number? And let's say it's one of the prime numbers from my set. All right, let's just call it p sub k. All right, and here's how we can write that. I can write this as p sub k is an element of. This is a mathematical notation. p sub k is an element of this set, which means k is somewhere between 1 and r. That doesn't really matter. Okay? So I'm assuming this p sub k divides nicely into m. If we divide nicely, it means if I take m divided by p sub k, I get a natural number. No fractions. I do not want to deal with fractions here. All right. Well, I'm going to kind of write that out, kind of see what that looks like. So divided by p sub k, and I'm saying that, that that is still a natural number. Well, that means I have to be able to do the exact same thing on the left-hand side. Divide this entire thing by p sub k, and, there, and then still get a natural number. Now, what I have to be doing, though, is I'm thinking of I have a sum in the numerator dividing by some number in the denominator. So this is really can be thought of as splitting this into two division problems. So I can rewrite this as a over p sub k plus 1 over p sub k equals m over p sub k. Now, we already know m over p sub k is a natural number. Take a look here. This is a over p sub k. And remember, a is a product of all of the primes in my list, and p sub k is in my list. This means that all I'm doing is just removing that p sub k from this initial product here. So a is still a product of a whole bunch of natural numbers. It's just without p sub k in there. Therefore, this is definitely a natural number, too. So we have this is a natural number, and this is a natural number. If this is a natural number, in order for this plus this to be a natural number, this has to also be a natural number. But take a closer look at it. This is 1 divided by p sub k. 
P is a piece of K is a prime number. All prime numbers are natural and greater than or equal to 2. So I'm taking one thing and dividing it by a number bigger than 1. So even if it's the smallest possible prime number, 2, this is 1 half. This is not a whole number, or a natural number, I mean. And so there's no way this can be a natural number, which means my original assumption must have been false. In other words, m as a composite number can't be divisible by any prime in this original set, which means it's divisible by some other prime that's not in this set. So therefore, the two possibilities for m, it's a prime number, means it's not in the set, or it's a composite number means it's divisible by a prime number that's not in this set. And either way, I found a new prime. And I can put it into this set and do it all over again if I wanted to. I could do this, and I had, since I put no restrictions on the size of this set, that means I can do this for as much as I want. That is, I can do it ad infinitum, into infinity. Or again, ad nauseum, until I want to puke. But I can do it for forever. That means there is no largest prime number. If I found every prime number I thought existed, and I did this method right here, I'm going to find a new prime number, guaranteed, every single time. Therefore, the size of the prime numbers is infinite, just like the size of the natural numbers. Okay, now we're going to take what we've just learned, put it all together, and derive the Euler product formula. To do this, we're going to start by defining a function. Now, if you don't remember what a function is, that's okay. It's going to be pretty straightforward, I promise. We're going to call our function zeta, we're going to use the lowercase zeta. Zeta is basically the Greek letter for z. And we're going to say the input variable is s. All right, and here's how we're going to define our function. Start by thinking about any natural number. Let's just call it n. Now we're going to raise n to the power of s. And now we're going to take the reciprocal of n to the s. And if you remember from your high school math, reciprocal basically just means flip the fraction. Okay? So we have 1 over n to the s. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take that as a sum over all the natural numbers. Okay? So that means it's going to be 1 over 1 to the s, plus 1 over 2 to the s, plus 1 over 3 to the s, plus 1 over 4 to the s, all the way into infinity over every natural number. And that's my function zeta. Now I'd also like to write this in a much more convenient way. And so what I'm really going to do is I'm going to think about, let's go ahead and put what's in the denominator back into the numerator. Now, we can't just move it without changing its value. But again, if you think back to high school algebra, you learned that if you make an exponent negative, then you just move the power to the other side of the fraction. So in this case, since it's 1 over n to the s, I just make it n to the negative s, and now it's back in the numerator. And so now my zeta function becomes 1 to the negative s, plus 2 to the negative s, plus 3 to the negative s, and so on, for all natural n. Okay, so here's where we get a little bit tricky. First, let's start by simplifying the very first term. It's 1 to the negative s. 1 to any power is just 1. So we're not even going to write the exponent. It's just a 1 to start my function. Next, I'm going to multiply zeta by the first term that comes after 1. In this case, it's 2 to the negative s. So I put 2 to the negative s out front of zeta. And then that means every term in zeta is getting multiplied by 2 to the negative s. And this gives me the following equation. Now I'm going to subtract these two things. I'm going to take my original zeta of s and subtract from it this new 2 to the negative s times zeta of s. All right, Kind of written out the long way, it looks a little something like this. But don't get too scared by it. We're going to simplify it one side at a time. Starting with the left side, I recognize that I've got a zeta of s on both terms. So I can just factor that out front, and I've got zeta of s times 1 minus 2 to the negative s. Now on the right-hand side, I'm going to look for every term that I have in common between both halves of these infinite sums. Okay. So in the first one, it starts with a 1, and there's no 1 over here, so I leave 1. And then I've got 2 to the negative s, and then over here is a minus 2 to the negative s, so those are gone. Then I've got a 3 to the negative s with no 3 to the negative s over here. And then I've got a 4 to the negative s minus a 4 to the negative s, so those are gone. And I keep doing that, and think about doing that into infinity. What have I done? I've gotten rid of all of the multiples of 2 to the negative s. Okay. And so what I'm left with is just odd 
numbers raised to the negative s right now. All right? Now, look at the first number after 1. It's 3 to the negative s. So I'm going to take what I have right now, and I'm going to multiply the whole thing by 3 to the negative s. So on the left side, I get 3 to the negative s times zeta of s times 1 minus 2 to the negative s. And then on the right side, I distribute the 3 to the negative s to each term, and I get what looks like below. Now, again, take what I just had before this and subtract from it what we just created. And we're going to again start on the left side. And notice what we have on the left. We have something in common in these two terms. Only it's not just zeta of s this time. It's zeta of s times 1 minus 2 to the negative s. If I factor that out of both terms, I now have zeta of s times 1 minus 2 to the negative s times 1 minus 3 to the negative s. And then on the right, I, go, I do the same thing. I look for all the terms that are the same between these two halves of these infinite sums that I'm subtracting from each other, and I cancel out all the ones that are the same, and then I have what's left over right here. And so this is what we have so far. And we're going to do this one more time. Hopefully you're seeing where we're going with this. If not, I will definitely explain it, but maybe one more time is what we need. What comes after the 1? Well, it's 5 to the negative s. Remember, the first one was 2 to the negative s, then 3 to the negative s. Now we're up to 5 to the negative s. I hope those numbers form a pattern to you. And I'm going to take that 5 to the negative s and multiply the entire function by that. And then we get the following on the left side and on the right side. And then just as before, we subtract. And again, focusing on the left side, I factor out what I have in common, which hopefully you'll see the pattern. And then on the right side, I cancel out what I have in common, and I write what I have left over. And here's what we have so far. And again, taking a look at the next number after 1, I see it's a 7. So I've got 2, 3, 5, and then 7 to the negative s. Hopefully you're seeing those are the prime numbers. All we're really doing is a variation on the sieve of Aristosthenes. I mean, we're factoring out all the multiples of these primes. We're setting the primes aside on the left-hand side, and then we're getting rid of them and all of their multiples on the right-hand side. Now, we know there's an infinite number of natural numbers, so my right-hand sum goes on forever, but we also know there's an infinite number of prime numbers, which means I could continue to do this for forever. No matter how large I get on the right, I can always find the next prime and factor out all of its multiples. And so I could, in theory, do this into infinity. And this was the genius of Euler, was he said, let's assume we can do that. Assuming we could actually reach infinity, what does that mean? Well, that means on the left-hand side, I'm going to have an infinite product that has every single prime number. And on the right-hand side, I've gotten rid of every natural number that can be composed of prime numbers and the prime numbers themselves, because the prime numbers have moved to the left. Well, other than one, every natural number is either prime or composite, which means they've all been gotten rid of. And I'm left with this infinite product on the left and just the number one on the right. And now I do a little bit of symbolic manipulation to get zeta of s by itself again. And what I'm doing is I'm going to divide by each of these products on the left-hand side. And so I divide by 1, well, I divide by 1 minus 2 to the negative s, which gives me 1 over 1 minus 2 to the negative s on the right side. Do the same thing with 1 minus 3 to the negative s, 1 minus 5 to the negative s, and so on through all the primes that, so that it would be of the form 1 minus p to the negative s. So on the right-hand side, they're all in the denominator. They're all 1 over 1 minus p to the negative s for every prime number p. And again, I want to think, let's simplify. Let's move it to the numerator. But I don't want to change its value, so I make its exponent the opposite. Well, for each of these factors, there is no exponent. It's just a quantity raised to the power of 1. When there is no exponent, we say there's a 1. So I have to make it a negative 1 and move that into the numerator. So I can write it thusly. And now we're going to look at how we can simplify this using different mathematical notation. OK, to simplify this, we're going to use a couple of mathematical notations that might at first appear cumbersome, but they're actually very nice to use. So we're going to start on the left-hand side of our equation. We had zeta of s. And remember, zeta of s is a sum. It's an addition problem with each term fitting a certain formula. And that formula was 
n to the power of negative s, where n is any natural number, and in fact, ultimately, it's every natural number. I'm adding them all up. And so we start the simplification by saying, okay, s for sum, s in Greek is sigma, so we use a capital sigma, and we say that the index of summation is n, meaning that's the variable I'm gonna keep filling in for from some set of numbers. In this case, the set is all natural numbers. So I say that n is an element of the naturals, and my formula that I'm summing is n to the negative s. And we write it like this. And this just means fill in each natural number for n, and after each time you do that, add it, add them all up. Now in this case, it is an infinite sum, but that's perfectly legitimate mathematically. We can do an infinite sum. And so this is how I simplify the zeta function. And now for the right-hand side, I'm gonna do basically the same thing. Here I'm not doing a sum, I'm doing a product, p for product. The Greek letter for p is pi, so we use a capital pi. And we say my index of the product here is p, and p is from the set of all prime numbers, so I write p as an element of the primes. And then I write the formula, which is one minus p to the negative s to the negative one. And when I write it like this, I'm saying what this means is substitute in every value of p from the prime number set, and then multiply all those results together. And again, it's an infinite product, but perfectly valid. We can do infinite products as well as infinite sums. And we know from what we just did that these two things are equal. We set them equal to each other, and there we have it, the Euler product formula. And look how elegant that is. I think that's beautiful. This is what I love about mathematics, is when we can find these kinds of intricate relationships that links the natural numbers and the prime numbers together arithmetically. Now they're not just a concept that we write down on a number grid and cross off and circle various numbers, but we can see mathematically how they are related to each other. And we've known about these numbers for thousands of years, but only just under 300 years ago was a man genius enough to figure all this out. And I think that's kind of cool. So there you have it, the Euler product formula. And remember, you watched it, you can't unwatch it. It's obvious I'm wide and nerdy. Think I'm just too wide and nerdy. Think I'm just too wide and nerdy. I'm just too wide and nerdy. Look at me, I'm white and nerdy.